As part of Ferrari Fridays, William Ross from the Exotic Car Marketplace will be discussing all things Ferrari and interviewing people that live and breathe the Ferrari brand. Topics range from road cars to racing, drivers to owners, as well as auctions, private sales, and trends in the collector market. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Ferrari Marketplace. This week, we have Crew Chief Eric joining us again as our moderator and participant. But we also have the motoring historian, Jonathan Summers, participating in this episode. And you will hear him on some more episodes, consequently, down the road as well. This man has a wealth of knowledge, and he's got his own podcast as well that you will find on the Motoring Podcast Network, MPN. MotoringPodcast.net is the website, so check it out. We got a lot more stuff coming on the site, so so pay attention. So this episode, this week for Ferrari Friday, we are going to talk about the Millie Millia. Now, obviously, with the release of the Ferrari movie, everyone's eyes kind of got you know glued to this time period and you know what was going on in that era. But we're going to kind of go through the post-war stuff, starting in about. 47. John's going to talk a little bit about the pre stuff and that kind of give the basis for everything because it happened, you know, they were racing before the war, then they had to jump in the gap and we started after. So John's going to kind of cover a lot of that stuff. He's going to get into a lot of the finer details of the million million itself, the race, the route, the drivers. I'm here to discuss the cars and crew chief Eric is here just to kind of jump in and ask the questions that I'm sure a lot of you want to know answers to. The first question is, John, how good is your Estelle Getty impersonation? Picture it, Brescia, 1933. <laughs> oh, yeah. This is a really interesting place that you started, Eric, because this is part of the story of the Mele Mele, is that it's a very Italian story. And when we look at film and photographs of the Mele Mele now, it's always in towns and there's always crowds of people. And it, it almost doesn't look like a motor race. It almost looks more like a fete or a festival or... You know, we're going to talk about the cars and the motor racing, but but really the Mille Mille exists in this in this shadow of the way that government was in Italy in the early 20th century. And as an Englishman, it's always quite amusing to me that the attitude of the British journalists that went there was that the really this showed that the Italians, you know, they, they could organize themselves. You know, it's quite impressive, really, that these Italian fellows could actually organize themselves. I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> Because that is what's going on here. And, and and this is really where I wanted to begin is we're going to talk a lot about the Mille Emilia in the post-war period. But but really, as an event, the Mille Emilia looks and feels like those really early city to city races. So in, in the early days, you know, the very first motor race was the Paris Rouen of 1895. It's considered the first motor race because the newspaper, a newspaper was like, we've got this newfangled technology. Let's try and tell some stories about it. Let's have all these peculiar vehicles. Some of them are steam powered. Some of them are buses. Some of them are motorcycles. But let's have them go from one town to another and let's write a story about it. It was meant to just be a, like a demonstration, an exposition. What the newspapers wrote about was who finished first. And, and that gave birth to motor racing. And what they would do, certainly at the turn of the century, would be like, we're in Paris, first man to Bordeaux's the winner. And they would just get in the cars and go. And it was really madcap. And the Mille Millia was born out of, of, of this kind of city to city road race. So even in the post-war period, even when the cars could do 180 miles an hour you still just close the public roads and you've got the soldiers and the policemen out to keep the farmers off the road and you had this route which changed every year but was approximately a figure of eight which always began in Brescia and would run down one coast and then come across the country to Rome and then it would turn north again and and come back north and and end in in Brescia always in the spring so often bad weather, changeable weather, often beginning in the small hours. So the cars are going to be flagged away from the start in the small hours because they're going to be racing all day because this is a 
thousand miles so although the route changed it always was a thousand miles probably should have done my research and be able to tell you why it was. that's what i'm here for <laughs> is to translate all the italian that's in the documentation right so for those that don't know the name of the race the mille miglia actually translates literally to 1000 miles well, why a thousand miles in a country of kilometers i only just thought of that what's up with these italians you know we can't make up our minds <laughs> The French may have invented motorsport, but we invented NASCAR. Think about I Circo Maximo in Rome, which you're familiar with, John. Isn't the chariot racing just NASCAR at the end of the day? Eric, I even cut my teeth as a tour guide, and I would show people around the Forum and the Coliseum like the other guides would, but I had a good shtick for the Americans because I would position the Circus Maximus as NASCAR, it really was like NASCAR, the attitudes of the fans and the whole razzmatazz of it. Those of you who've not been to Rome and haven't studied the chariot racing, the pod racing of the Star Wars universe is basically a pretty straight ripoff. If you watch the pod racing scene and thought, hasn't George Lucas recently watched Ben-Hur? Yes, he had. The scene in Ben-Hur, in Ben-Hur where you've got the dolphins, there were these giant silver dolphins and slaves would knock the dolphins for each lap that was done. Caligula, the Roman emperor, would bet a lot. He was big into betting on it. If you think of NASCAR with betting now, we've digressed somewhat there, haven't we? In this sort of initial period, as we talk about the Mille Millia, I really wanted to draw a distinction between the event as it was up to 1957 and the event as it is now. So the event as it is now is a really awesome open road race event. For many years, it's been organized by a chap called Mark Gessler, and I've had the pleasure of working with Mark on various different projects, not to do with the Mille Millia. But the notion of the modern event is where you, we take cars that participated in the event years ago, and we drive from town to town, often with a police escort. It's in Italy, so that police escort might be motorcycles. We might be able to do more than 100 miles an hour on a piece of Italian autostrada yep. or not on a piece of Italian autostrada. This modern event is not a procession, but nor is it the full on pedal to the metal cannonball that the original event was. The original event was nonstop. This event you overnight in a nice five star hotel. And it's a wonderful way to commemorate the original event, but the modern event has nothing to do with the original event in in terms and the original event was around in the world sports car championship for three or four years of its of its existence the modern one now too i mean it's actually route book the whole nine yards time sections and everything they kind of i want to say want to try and hold people back in regards to excessive speed but you know you're going to have your outliers out there that just you know they're not in it they don't care they're just having fun you know, it's kind of a different animal in regards to what it is back, what it was back then as compared to now. And they get, geez, I think they get like 300, 250 to 300 entrants, like right now, something like that. I know they get a large amount of participants. My understanding is it's a bit of a sport to get a car that you're going to be invited to enter with. Because on the face of it, we think about, you know, Maserati 450S or a Ferrari 290MM, you know, these are the cars that that we think about as Mille Mille cars. But you look, I mean, there's lots of film on YouTube of the original events, and you can see there, it's all like little Fiat 1100s and much smaller cars. In period, a few people could afford the Ferraris, and there were lots of Fiat 1100s. Of course, nowadays, the people that want to participate in the event are the Ferrari and Maserati guys. So what they try and do is they try and have some of that, but they also try and allow... You'll see Bentleys in the event now, because Bentleys were eligible for the event in period although no Englishman entered no Englishman entered nobody bought a Bentley and my understanding is and I, I don't know much about I'm not like I would never claim to be an expert on the Mille Mille pre-war my understanding is that there are very very few foreign entrants like I think there were no British entrants and one or two German entrance. So what you're looking at is really an event which has the feel of the Isle of Man TT, that yes, this is an international motoring event, but it's something which the locals seem to excel at. And I think that's partly because you really need to have the local knowledge there. So in the case of the Mille Mille, the Italians knew the road so they could race better 
than the Brits or the Germans who who went and tried to. Yeah, I think it was like 90, 95 percent of all ends like pre-war were it was all Italian. Yeah, you had your German here, a couple French. Here. I mean, extremely minimal. But the majority, 99 percent, were just all Italian. And Ferrari in that pre-war period, it was Scuderia, Ferrari, Alfa Romeos that were really the yeah winners for the bulk of the 1930s, at least. If, if we look at the 30s, not the 20s, and it's that classic Alfa 1750 with the Zagato body. You know, when you picture the classic 30s Alfa Romeo, that's, that's the car. And I always feel like it was Victory at Le Mans and Targa and, and the Mille Miglia that built Alfa Romeo's reputation and built Ferrari's reputation pre-war. So before we go too far down into the 1930s, between the two wars, right, as the Mille Miglia is ramping up and there's the iconic turn and kind of renaissance of the Mille Miglia in 1940, and we'll get to that. I want to take us just a step back to something you said earlier, John, and hopefully you can clarify it for the audience. You know, you talked about how motorsport started in the 1890s, you know, with the French and things like that. And then we joked about the Romans, but the first road race is credited to the Vanderbilt Cup. I wonder, is the Mille Miglia, as we jokingly refer to it as the cannonball of Europe, is it the first road rally? Is there a rally that precedes it? The Targa Florio dates from 1902. So the Targa Florio, which is, it's on Sicily, it was set up by an Italian nobleman. They use different routes. You know, they'd been all around the island. The classic route is, I think, 44 miles, eight miles along the coast, the rest of the time winding around the coast road. But it was always that, it was always on Sicily, and it always had a uniquely Sicilian character. The Mille Miglia doesn't come along until 1927, and the Mille Miglia is this notion that it will be all Italy. So the Mille Miglia is this very much this creature of the fascist age after Le Mans, because Grand Prix racing, the early era of the city to city races, and then from 1906, 1906 was the first French Grand Prix, the first Grand Prix, and, and this introduced this notion of, of circuit race. But then the feeling was that uh, certainly amongst the French, certainly when they were being beaten by the Italians and the Germans, the feeling was that perhaps we needed to get back to basics and we needed to get away from these prototype racing machines and we needed to create a challenge which replicated real motoring. So the thought was, we'll race for 24 hours and we'll race with touring cars. And thus Le Mans was born. And my sense is that the, the four guys that created the Mille Miglia created something that was for similar cars as might race at Le Mans. This was not for prototypes. This was for what we would know today as sports cars. Were the previous point-to-point -point races timed like the Mille Miglia was? Are they time distance rallies? Yes. You leave Paris, the Paris control. And then the key thing was to get your time cards stamped at Bordeaux. And of course, the innovation that the Mille Miglia introduced, at least in the post-war period and in the top classes, was the number tells you exactly the time that the car leaves. So if the car's carrying 531, that means it left Brescia at 531. So if car 531 comes by and then car 527 comes by, you know that not only is 531 past 527 on the road, but he's five minutes ahead in the race. And you know that from the side of the road just by watching the cars come by. No complicated lights like they have at Le Mans. And certainly none of the, who, who, who was that and who's leading <laughs> confusion that was motorsport years ago. No, you, it's on the side of the car. It's interesting, that magnificent Shell movie on YouTube, there's that AI-enhanced version of it now. You can illustrate it illustrates exactly the point that I was trying to make then, although I... <laughs> we'll just have to search for it on YouTube, that's all. Let's jump back into this. The Mille Mille kicks off 1927, and then there's a, a major milestone in its history right around 1933, and then again in 1940, and we'll continue to move forward. So, John, take us on that journey. You kind of set the stage. We've compared and contrast some other famous races that started within that decade. You talked about Le Mans, the Vanderbilt Cup. We talked about all these other races. Where does the Mille Mille go in its first five years? Let's see it through Ferrari's eyes. Ferrari himself is born in Modena, which is on the route of the Mille Miglia. And the Via Emilia passes by not far from Ferrari's front door. So he sees motor racing on the Via Emilia. He sees the early Mille Miglias very close to his home. And for Ferrari, you know, late in life, he didn't want to leave that whole area of, of northern Italy. He's often will make reference to 
he himself wasn't a great craftsman or artisan. He was an agitator of men, it's agitator of men line we, we see over and over in this. And the agitator of men, he has this success because of the craftsman of Modena. So you have that, this sense in these early years that this burgeoning motorsport industry and this race, which is centered ar around Brescia and Bologna and Modena and this autostrada connecting these cities together long before the German autobahn or freeways or, or motorways, the Italians had thought about connecting the race. It's natural, right? The Romans built these kind of roads and just linked to that Roman history there. The checkpoint for many years, the Rome checkpoint, was at the Milvian Bridge, which is on the northern bit of Rome where the Appian Way crosses over. But the Milvian Bridge was where Constantius defeated, I can't remember the name of the Roman emperor that he defeated, but where Constantius defeats the last pagan Roman emperor and makes Rome Christian in the year 312. You know, this is where you get your paper stamped before you race on. So always in Italy, right, we're steeped with this history. It, it would be fair to say early on we have events that really are, are races of attrition and that benefit cars that are built like Bentley. So, you know, famously, the first foreign winner is Caracciola in a Mercedes SSK. People always, I, I think, I would say overlook in regards to, you know, the pre-war time. And to uh, John was stating, you know, you know, Enzo's enthusiasm for motor racing. And I think a lot of people overlook or forget. I mean, he wasn't world champion with it, but he was a decent wheel man when he was racing for Alfa Romeo. He did rather well. And so getting into that area, and I know he batted around a bit in his youth and trying to find his way, but, you know, he did pretty well with Alfa and helping them grow into, you know, I say being the dominant force 20s into the early mid 30s until they decided to pull out. You know, he had a big role in regards to creating I guess you would say, you know, this dominating format in regards to teams, our singular team, you know, and I, and he obviously he carried that throughout his life, his ups and downs. But obviously, when he broke out onto his own post-war, he was allowed to, you know, due to contract obligations because he wasn't allowed to for a you know, set amount of time from Alpha, but able to create his own, build his own cars and start racing. It did not take him long to become dominant in the racing arena. And, and as everyone knows, I mean, that was his thing. You know, he had wanted nothing to do with road cars or anything like that. He wanted to build race cars for business aspects. You know, he had to get into building road cars for rich people because it helps fund his racing endeavors. You'll see as we talk in this episode, getting up to about 1953, you'll see, I guess you would say the gestation, the growth of the cars themselves is not really like big monumental leaps. You know, yeah, maybe the body shape and this way the engine's built and, you know, some of the parameters and characteristics of the motors and everything like that, how they're made, and, you know, internal wise and just bore stroke, all that kind of stuff. There isn't this massive like jump that you'll see 54 and on, say in the 57, it evolved pretty slowly. And obviously the war had a big effect on progression in regards to these cars kind of jumping quickly. War's over and you, know, you have all these engineers and whatnot starting to come back into play. But it's pretty interesting to look at the cars themselves pre-war and then after the war and when they start getting you know start to race back up again it's a leap from when they stopped to when they started again but not like monumental regards to horsepower and speed it all hovered around 150 200 some horsepower and going at maybe top speeds of 120 130 well, nothing crazy because you think about that today you're like well that's nothing but you know you got to look at what the cars were back then you know that was pretty sketchy in regards to what these cars were going at that rapid rate but then it's interesting to see what that jump that happens post-war in regards to how these cars just all of a sudden just, just kind of took off horsepower and everything. Correct me if I'm wrong, but there's also something here that William touched on that we can unpack for just a second. Enzo was a driver. He was part of Alfa Romeo's racing team, the early days of Formula One, right? Obviously, huge influences there, not only from Alfa Romeo, but Maserati. When you look at some of the early Ferraris, they're modeled after those cars that he was familiar with. But he was also one of the four horsemen of the famed Quadrifoglio, right? The shamrock that you see on the side of the Alfa Romeos, those four leaves are for the four drivers, one of those being Enzo, another one, Tazio Nuvolari, and so on down the line. There's some interesting stories and characters and big name drivers during this period of the early days of the Mila Milia. Let's unpack that for a, a moment as we get closer and closer to the 1940s and the war. 
you know, the two big names, you know, the non-Italian winner. They've only ever been driving Mercedes and one with Caracciola. So so we should credit Caracciola, really. And if there had been a Formula One World Championship in the 1930s, Caracciola would have won it more than anybody else. So there seems little doubt that he was the complete driver of the 30s. I, I feel like for historians and for Ferrari himself, Nuvolari really stood out as a guy who... In the book Ferrari wrote about drivers, he has a line about how the first time he ever sat next to Nuvolari, the first corner they got to, he thought he wasn't going to make it around because Nuvolari's whole cornering style was not to lift off the throttle. You just turn the car into a slide and skidded the car around the corner. In in other words, you know, he was very much from the Ari Barton and Bo Duke school (laughs) of cornering. The first newspaper mention. This is from Count Johnny Lorani's biography of, of Nuvolari. The first mention of, of Nuvolari anywhere in, in literature is a newspaper that describes him as an audacious young man. So huge, huge cojones. And look, along with Ferrari, right, there's this deep tragedy around Nuvolari. When we talk about the post-war Mille Milius, we'll see that the guy drove out of his skin, arguably the greatest drives ever, you know, of anybody in any motor race ever kind of thing. I think you could make a case for Nuvolari in the 47 and 48 Mille Milius, but he had two sons and lost them during the war. So this post-war Nuvolari is a Nuvolari who does not want to die in bed. He wants to die on the road. He wants to send it. How do you race yeah. that guy? How do you raise somebody who is publicly... St- and this is, not, this is not some crazy Andrew Tate guy. This is a middle-aged guy who will look the interviewer straight in the eye and say, I will race your car, Ferrari, and I really hope I die on the road. I will race so hard. I mean, it is just... Maybe he was Sigmund Freud's inspiration for the whole Death Wish study, right? And he was all around Tatsio Nuvolari. <laughs> You know, we'll, we'll talk about the 1952 winner, Giovanni Bracco, later. And I, I read that Bracco's phrase was either it goes or I'll crash it. That's so Italian. <laughs> this is not some Anthony Gobert, like crazy teenage motorcycle rider. This is a, a middle aged man. And so I, I feel like this is to be in a part of the a product of the fascist era. So, so Nuvolari's great foil at Scuderia Ferrari in the Mille Miglia. Achille Varzi and and Varzi has a very different manner where you know Nuvolari has this kind of Bodu handling cornering style Achille Varzi very precise and very together and and very structured both come from motorcycles and at this point almost everybody we're going to talk about began their career racing motorcycles Mm -hmm. before turning to cars the the really famous post-war story of Nuvolari and Varzi is towards the end of one million million, I think 33 or 34 Nuvolari spots Varzi ahead and in order to pass him he switches his lights off and comes up behind him and then passes suddenly and unexpectedly. So Varzi can't see him coming and is is defeated again. Yeah, I and mean, that's pitch dark. You're not talking like now you got street lights and like lit up. And like, no, I mean you're you're talking pitch dark and a road that's maybe what eight feet wide, ten feet at best. Yeah. I mean, that's some cojones. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And and what we're talking about here is this was the only, the only person who saw that was Vartsi, right? Vartsi, there's only the four of them, the two co-drivers and the drivers out there. And the, there is the sense of epic gladiators battling here. If you look at the pictures of them, uh, uh, images of them, Nuvolari is so, sort of small and, and wiry, sort of prune-like man. And, and Vartsi has this very sort of fascist, slicked over hair and usually has a has a cigarette on, <laughs> had an affair with another driver's wife whilst he was at Auto Union. She introduced him to heroin. Ooh. End over ended the car at 180 miles an hour. Now, he did come out of that whole process again, but I visited his hometown. It's just north of Turin. There's a wonderful museum there. You need to, like, talk to a librarian and so on and, and get in there. But the way that the Alfa Romeo Formula One team got themselves ready for Vazi post-war was absolutely incredible. He was all set to be the Formula One world champion. And then 
he rolled the car in bam and, and knocked himself on the head and, and and was and was gone now it's really interesting in a lot of photographs the team took on Fangio, poor lad from South America who's come from South America and now is this prodigy. In a lot of the photographs of the car, he even looks like Vazzi. You can only tell the difference because Vazzi always had the cigarette and Fangio doesn't. So you've this sort of sense that when Vazzi went, the family and the team in, in, I can't remember the name of the town in Italy that he was from, but they've sort of adopted him. And the museum, it's hard to tell when the driver that we follow was Vazzi and when it was... He did transportation stuff in the war, Vazzi. He was much wealthier than Nuvolari, could always buy a better car sooner. And, and this is important for Ferrari and, and the sports cars, because with Ferrari, we very much get this sense that he has to take the money from the customers, from the noblemen who are buying the cars to keep the light switched on, even though what he really wants to do is give the car to people like Nuvolari, who he knows are going to drive the Bejesus outfit and potentially win the race with it. On that point, you know, in regards to selling the cars to noblemen, you know, you look at post-war, we get to that point, we get there, but you'll see there's a large contingent of Ferraris. I mean, you have 20, there's 20 plus Ferraris in it, but there's only maybe two or three, maybe four max factory cars that, you know, are, are you know, being, now these gentlemen drivers and whatnot, you know, have some factories for whatnot, but there's really not like, normally you kind of have the opposite where you have like this big factory team, four or five factory drivers, and you got like two or three private. Units. It was, you know, complete opposite. And I mean, they had a massive contingent of privately entered Ferraris in the race year in, year out. Which is really interesting because we have come full circle on that paradigm in sports car and endurance racing. There is no Ferrari factory team. There is no Corvette factory team. There is no Porsche factory team. They're all privateers under license from the factory. Yeah. So we've come 100 years later, full circle on all that. So that's really, really interesting. As we speak about these drivers, it's, you know, the ones that win and participated, I always find very interesting. I don't know what I have to do with maturity or what have you, but again, also the mentality. Because as you know, you get older, you get more cautious. You think more in regards to what you know can happen. You put that in your head. A lot of these guys were in their late 30s, 40s, even some of these guys, you know, 50 plus that were racing in these events and just going balls out. You would think you get that age, you're kind of like, oh, I'm going to be a little hesitant because I know what could happen. You know, if I hit this or what, you know, these guys were not young. There's a couple instances here and there, but I don't know if it was back then, you know, you know, as you age, you know, maturity, what have you. And they kind of looked down at these youngsters, you know, that, oh, they don't have the maturity. They don't have, you know, they looked at them differently. But, you know, I always found it interesting. It's like the age of these people, these gentlemen that are raised. You know, they were up there. You know, they were no spring chickens. And like, you know, speaking about Marcel, like smoking. These guys smoke, drink. It's not like it's to this day and age where you got these working out every day. You got nutritionists and all this stuff in regards to, you know, watching every ounce and everything like that. A lot of these guys were rather portly. Or you got Fangio who's chewing on coca leaves the whole time, right? Yeah, just to keep them up there. Geeked right? out. <laughs> What's also happening in this period, the race starts in 1927. We've been talking a little bit about 1933 and in the, in the early 30s. So we got that six year jump there. And then we're creeping closer to the 40s, creeping closer to World War II. The technology advancements that are occurring from the mid 20s to the mid 30s to the early 40s are huge. It's like a space race compared to today where we're not searching for seconds anymore. We're searching for hundredths and thousandths of a second, which is a lot of technology for very little return. But in those days, all sorts of invention, ingenuity and things were going on. So John, talk to us about that and how that influences the birth of the first Ferraris. Certainly the, the key technology, of, I think, for the 20s is supercharged. The Mercedes that the, won the Mille Mille with it was supercharged. And this created this sort of dichotomy in motorsport at the period where the unlimited cars would make plenty of power and be supercharged. And then there was a whole class of unsupercharged cars that were similar to the ones that every day people could use. So there was always this contrast within the, the Mille Mille. I suppose the other thing that, that we should say about it is that, you know, yes, a, a definite class of car emerges that is good at this kind of event. We might even call it the Grand Touring car, the Grand Touring motorsports car. What we're saying is that, you know, a Bentley could win Le Mans, but it wasn't really the ideal shape for it. Mercedes SSK could win Le Mans, but it was not really the ideal shape for it. An Alpha 1750 with a Zagato body on it, now that 
was much more of what we might understand to be the first. And indeed, you can make that position that those Alphas that, that won the Mille in the 30s very much count as, you know, the first sports cars. Before we move on from this post-war period, let's just cover off the weirdness of the end of the Mille Mille in the post-war period. There was a really bad accident in 1938. A car hit, went over a level crossing into the crowd. And that was the end of the event. The event was stopped. There was no event in 1939 even though war hadn't broken out in that part of Europe yet. There was even an event in 1940. The event in 1940 was, um, from my reading about it, it feels as if the Italians tried to do an event just for them, but then unexpectedly the Germans like showed up with these hot rod BMWs driven by Hushka von Hanstein, who became the, uh, you know, the face of Porsche motorsport in the post-war period. I guess the course was no longer the sort of crazy open roads. It was a triangle of closed roads. And, and this is, this is very much in keeping with racing on the public roads in continental Europe and Ireland. You know, in, in Ireland, there's still motorcycle racing, the same kind of thing as you see at the Isle of Man TT, but you know, less money club stuff. It's three towns joined together in a triangle. Reims, Rams, the circuit in northern France is this three towns joined together. This is a, this is a classic kind of layout. So the Mille Mille in 1940 used that kind of format. It was won by, as I said, Hans Steen in this, in this BMW quite famously. The photo of him on the podium, he has his SS insignia on his, on his overalls there. There were British people there. War had been declared I, th- I think it must have been a very very peculiar event you know i always feel like it warrants further research in my mind it doesn't count as, as a mille mille or, or it stands aside there's like post-war period the pre-war period and then there's this funny 1940 anomaly for our purposes i think it's really worth talking about because this is the first time a car that ferrari built himself enters so this is the period where he's had the falling out with alfa romeo we should go back to the fact that his relationship with Alfa Romeo is really odd, that they don't have a works racing team. They just have him doing it for them. And it seems from some of the reading that you do, a lot of this is predicated around Ferrari's personal relationship with Gabato, the boss of Alfa Romeo. But then there comes this sort of falling out with this character, Wilfred Reichart. He has this estrangement. Ferrari has this estrangement from Alfa Romeo. Whilst he's estranged, he can't build his own cars. This is the the understanding. So he doesn't build a car under his own name, a Ferrari. He builds this, probably no better than me, William Auto Avioni. My town, I can't, it's not good, but Auto Avio Construzione 815. You know, but it feels like a Ferrari, right? Eight cylinders and 1,500 cc's. The nomenclature is there right from the start. From memory, not such an impressive showing on the event, but he was there in that pre-war Mille Miglia in a car that wasn't an Alpha with a Ferrari shield on the side of it, which is all he'd done up to then. So that's really where Ferrari begins at the Mille Miglia. In. Yeah, he had two cars entered. Yeah, they both retired. But, you know, the main thing is, is if memory serves me, you know, when he created the name it put under, it was he was trying very hard to hide the fact that it was him just because, you know, with what happened with Alfa Romeo and, you know, them saying, hey, you can't go out and build your own cars and everything like that. But, you know, that desire and that need to do it was just so strong. Then the cars, you know, they kind of took on a look of a lot of other vehicles of that day kind of looked a lot like a, a BMW and stuff like that. You know, it's, I want to say, I say copying, but it had a very similar look to a lot of other cars back in that day. You know, I don't know at that point, you know, you still had that very strong presence of these coach builders in that area and sending them out. Obviously money had to been extremely tight for him in regards to, you know, getting these things put together, you know, how much testing input and everything that you know gone into these cars and it nothing like what's you know it kind of is today but the key thing is is this is where you know he basically starts creating his aura in so to speak in regards to getting into being you know builder that he became so it got him going obviously unfortunately we know what happens <laughs> later you know in the coming months in that region and a certain gentleman up in germany getting some crazy ideas so it kind of distracts from that you know, and he goes into his tool making business and, you know, keeps everything going. And, you know, he did well, you know, at that point in time, too. So, I mean, he was setting himself up for post-war, kept himself very neutral. You know, people kind of say, oh, he joined the fascist party of that. But, yeah, he did. 
he didn't participate in a lot of stuff. It was more just to kind of not say much gain favor, you know, to get the government contracts and kind of just, you know, working the system, doing the politics and everything like that. But he really wasn't a face of it or anything like that. He did what he had to do in regards to what needed to be done to survive the war. That 815, AEAC or ACC or whatever it was, that auto aviazione, construzione, that thing, that was eight cylinders. Yet post-war, he's doing 12 cylinders, but still in this very small capacity why why was he doing 12 why didn't he just do a four cylinder that's what fiat was doing now i believe with the eight cylinder when he did that it, it had a lot to do with what he had available to him in regards to be able to build the car so he couldn't go out and build his own you know cast his own block and do anything like that he took a lot of pieces of parts from everywhere and built these cars so hence that first one was an eight cylinder you hit the nail on the head william Ferrari was resourceful, especially starting out, right? He had to beg, borrow, and steal from wherever he could. Obviously, he was on the rocks with Alfa Romeo in some ways, right? Undercover, trying to develop his own car, all this kind of stuff. Who's he going to go to for an engine at that point, right? He's not going to get it from Fiat. Fiat's not building the 8V until the 1950s. He's not going to get it from Alfa Romeo. He doesn't have his own engine. Like you said, he's not building his own. He's going to turn to Maserati, and borrow from the 1939 Maserati race car, which had a V8 engine. So it makes sense to get a hold of one of those, jam it in your own chassis, make some modifications, stamp the head, call it a Ferrari, and go on with life. The Americans were ahead of the game. Cadillac had a V8 in the early 19-teens, along with a couple other brands. And then you've got Packard with what they called the Twin Six, which is the V12 as we know it. He's looking beyond his boundaries to say, what can I do to build a better mousetrap? Because remember, Ferrari in the early days, he's quoted as saying this, I could care less about the car. It's all about the engine, right? Build a bigger engine, build a bigger power plant. There was nothing in Italy bigger than the Maserati V8 at that time because the V8s that came, came later. Pre-war period, the reason that there weren't very many V engines, Lancia did that V4, but really nobody did successful V engine. You know, the V8 pre-war wasn't really that, well, I guess the flathead V8 was successful, wasn't it? Certainly Mercedes-Benz, their pre-war racing cars were straight motors, weren't they? Because you just it was just easier to do a strong, you only needed to do one casting. You didn't need to do the two castings in in the V and you know until Lancia do a, a V6 to race with you know in our period here you know nobody had done V6s at all so it's an interesting point isn't it because you do wonder and it, I, I feel like I need to do more research now <laughs> you know right there if you imagine Ferrari trying to build that AAC okay I need to like cast an engine how do I go about and do that you can't just like call up a machine tool manufacturer can you so there must have been he must have had access, you know, so it's Modena. It is that relationship with Alpha because I know there was the falling out, but he remains on good terms with Gabato personally. I've got to believe that there were. He never wanted to let them know what he was up to, right, with the racing program. So the logical conclusion is he went to Maserati for an engine. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah, really interesting. Where are we in the timeline now? We're like 1940s-ish. You talked about the Mille Miglia that wasn't the Mille Miglia. And I will add a footnote here that our friend Paul Baxa from the Society of Automotive Historians has a whole presentation that we are airing on Break Fix as part of our History of Motorsport series that's going to come out a little bit later. So you actually be able to dive into the 1940 Mille Miglia very, very deeply on that. So I, I want to give him a shout out that we've got that coming. So 1941, 42, we're talking about the beginning of the war. Is the Mille Miglia put on hold or does it continue through the war or does it restart post-war? Where are we at? It restarts post-war in 1947. Remember, it had sort of stopped in 1938 and then it had restarted in this circuit format. Now in 47, it's like 1938 never happened. And we're going back to this crazy open road race around the country. You know, I lived in Italy for a year and, and uh, I lived with a really weird German guy who was very into Italian cinema. And I went to a number of 50s Italian movies with him. And I remember after the third one saying to him, are all 50s Italian movies about some poor widow who like has to work in the fields? Or be a prostitute, but she yes. chooses to nobly work in the fields. Is yes. that what it's all about? And he was like, yes. 
And then we get into this big diatribe about how it's the land and it's that she personifies Italy. And this is why Sophia Loren and, and all of when we think about the Mille Emilia coming back, we have to see it in this context of Italy rebuilding itself, of remembering a good time, of remembering, as we said before, a festival. The early route maps, the route maps from the 40s and the 50s, they would list, you know, Serafini driving Ferrari, but they would also list, you know, Siena. And here's a photograph of the cathedral in Siena kind of thing, it, it, because this is the route that we're taking. So we have this feeling of Italian festival, which brings the events back. And as William alluded to earlier, in those events in 47, 48, cars weren't really, they were what had survived the war, pulled out and dusted off. And the drivers were very much the same kind of, you know, pulling themselves out of the cupboard and, and dusting themselves off a little bit. So, you know, that 1947 winner, Alfa Romeo 2900B, I mean, that's a beautiful car and, and even a fast car by modern standards, but it's a completely pre-war design. You know, you had a lot of the drivers participating, basically just, hey, just starting back up. They participated pre-war. Now they're doing a post-war. I mean, you have a lot of guys that won pre-war that win post-war. You know, and you got to look at it, basically 10 years in regards to that gap. And you know, these guys weren't young, so to speak, when they you know, did it pre-war. It says a lot there in regards to, I guess you say, the desire, you know, and there's that passion to race, you know, and getting back to, I would say not to the roots, but, you know, just getting back to it and going for it. So in 47, Ferrari officially opens his car factory as we note the birth of ferrari 1947 what did the rest of the field look like you know we talked about bentley pre-war we obviously talked about alfa romeo a couple of bmws in there a mercedes what does the 1947 48 49 entry list for the mila milia look like who's allowed to race anybody as i read somewhere any tom dick or luigi is allowed <laughs> to enter <laughs> You talked earlier about the classing system where it was sort of like 300 horsepower and above with your forced induction or these regular pedestrian cars, you know, the Cinquecentos and all those things of the world that existed back then. Did that dichotomy still exist or was there a proper classing system in 47? Had they figured it out in the 10 years that had gone by or were they still running sort of fast and loose and developing the race as they were going along? The bulk of the entry is always small capacity Fiat, Fiat 11. Many of those were sedans. Then you had guys like Zagato and Abarth who made a career for themselves, putting these beautiful aerodynamic bodies on Fiat 1100s. Because if you think of it, you know, those Adriatic Straits, I've read, I don't know if this was true, that Jaguar needed a higher back axle ratio for the Mille Miglia than they used at Le Mans. Le Mans's got a three-mile straight, and it was for those Adriatic straights. So if you can imagine how wrung out Fiat 1100 would have been on those kind of straights, any extra little bit of horsepower, any improved aero you can find. So, you know, we, we look at the second-generation Prius, and we see that little indent on the roof. Well, that bubble was a Zagato, you know, styling trait, but it's literally about making... The frontal area that little bit less so it can cut through the air a, a little bit faster and the crucible that these guys were testing themselves in was the mille milia that was the the indianapolis 500 of uh you know events so most of the entry list is standard little fiats a lot of the entry list is these hot rodded little fiats then you also have larger touring cars so four door alfa romeo this kind of thing you see a lot of that stuff being entered. Any French entrants? Some, but no, not very many. Because remember, in, in the post-war period, it, there's no motor racing in 45 or 46. And then in 47, there's, you know, the first British event was in Jersey in 1947. And there is this sense of some re recovery in 1947. But really, the French weren't in a, a position to do much much motor racing at that time in my uh, in my experience so 1948 there's a plethora of fiats and then the ferraris begin their dominance and i know dominance in motorsport we don't think about that 
back then, like we do today, when you talk about, you know, Schumacher and Hamilton and now Verstappen and things like that in the Formula One and some of the other disciplines, but Ferrari was becoming dominant and they set dominance for almost a decade in that period, the year after they officially opened their doors as a company. So educate the audience on the significance of 48 up through 57 and where that takes the rest of the conversation about the Mila Mila. For 47, you know, with that entry, the car that they raced that actually had won their prior race in the Grand Prix of Rome. So, I mean, he already was going in as a race winning car constructor, I guess you could say. Was that a 166 that first year, Willie? No, the uh, 125 in 47. It has that, you know, weird looking front end. You want to see that grill's almost like an aisle of a Aston Martin DB2, 3, you know, that weird look to it. But, I, you know, that's one thing right out of the gate. First race, retires. Second race, they win. And so then they go to the middle of Amelia and it retires in that race. But, you know, he came out of the gate pretty hot, I guess you could say, in regards to winning. The Grand Prix of Rome obviously wasn't the Mille Amelia and obviously length, endurance, and what that road is. So, you know, you have a lot of brutality in regards to what a car has to take, potholes, everything like that. Just, you know, it's getting beat to hell by the road itself. It's pretty impressive what they come up with. And obviously, we get into 48. That's when they really, you know, make that leap in regards to, you know, having several cars in it, say, dominating. You know, there's that line that I've used in some of my other presentations that Ferrari uses in a, a documentary that, you know, when he was working in the First World War, he was worked in the Packard factory and he fell in love with the V12 engine, these Packard aero engines. I fell in love with the V12 and I have never got divorced. That was the, the quote. That yeah. I got. Anyone listening, you know, if they read, obviously, you know, you have a couple of big you know, novels in regards to Enzo's history. But the one thing you know and understand about Enzo Ferrari is he knew how to work, I guess you would say, the story, narrate to make it in his favor. I always look at it when you hear a lot of these stories, you know, kind of like going back to what you talked about before in regards to how about Lamborghini with the tractor or the clutch, what have you know, you know, you're going to hear all these little nuanced stories. And there's always little tweaks to it. And my understanding was that he went with the 12-cylinder because of the Packard. But when he was able to build everything himself, it's one thing, okay, you build a frame. It's just tube. And back then, those frames were pretty straightforward. Two tubes, some cross members, and what have you, start building it up. You know, and beating the metal, you know, using the English wheel and using hammers, dollies and wooden bucks and everything like that. Casting your own blocks. I mean, you're talking molten metal in regards to building this stuff and sand casting all this stuff. It's incredible the infrastructure get put into place to build those cars. So you know, you're basically building everything yourself from scratch. It wasn't like you were, hey, I'm going to order this from over here. I'm going to order this from this manufacturer or whatnot. I mean, a majority of things, they made and manufactured themselves. But the electronics, I think, if memory says, they were using Lucas Electronics and stuff from the UK. There's so certain things they were bringing in, but your major components, you know, they were manufacturing themselves. But getting on the 12-cylinder, my understanding was because just he loved that Packard and just the sound of it and the power, the delivery and how smooth it was. And it was about how effortlessly it ran. And with the Vanderbilt Cup, that kind of played a little bit of role into it, how well Packard did and that kind of stuff back then as well. It played a big role in it, which is kind of surprising because you wouldn't think an American car is going to have influence on this Italian you know, automaker, but it played a big role. To me, it all makes sense when you look back over what was available at the time. So who's he going to turn to with the biggest, baddest engine on the block? The Packard Twin Six. Yeah. You look at the displacement of the difference between the two. Those 12s, those V12s in the beginning, you know, they weren't very big displacement wise. In your mind, you think V12, you're thinking this big monstrous engine, everything like that. Oh, it's 12 cylinder, six, you know, it's like, that's like a two liter 12 cylinder. But that's when you're borrowing jugs from a Fiat and you're trying to put it all together, right? You know, I thought there was a rational reason for the V12 around the fact that they can usually rev high. And even the Packard motor, the reason they call it twin six is it's two straight sixes together. It's not an actual casted V. So yeah. even then it's sort of, we're working towards what the V12 becomes, you know, the classic V12s from Ferrari and Jaguar and so down the line. So, you know, it's a little nuanced thing. And and, and I refer to the Packards as a twin six for that specific reason, because it is two straight sixes together on one crank. 
All right. So here we are. We're jumping back into the, the beginning of the Dolce Vita period. We're talking about the reconstruction of Italy, the, the renaissance of the Mila Emilia. So we're fast forwarding 1947 into 48, 49, 50, and so on down the line. So do we want to talk about some of the notable cars from this period, specifically the Ferraris, William? Where do we want to take the conversation now that we're in this sweet spot of the Mila Emilia's rebirth? I guess you'd say being sports tours and what have you is a majority of these cars were all closed coupes. You might have had the rare one here and there. It's not until you started getting more subsequent years until he said, no, it needs to be an open top Barquetta. A lot of it kind of, and you go back and I'm sure John can you know hit on these points, is some of the drivers preferred the coupe to the Barquetta just because sound, noise, comfort, what have you. And, and not to mention a majority of these guys were driving wearing double-breasted suits. So they don't want to get their clothes dirty. So <laughs> it's not so much in the, some of the early years, or I'd say, you know, of the Ferrari cars, but as you get into subsequent years, you could have three, four different models makes of Ferraris in the race. Now they obviously had different size classes and what have you, you know, so you compete. I think it was a 2000 CC was a, like something like that. So there's obviously those little subsequent subclasses, you know, you could race the one as well, but you know, you always had a mixture of cars in there. The one, obviously the one was the one six, six S in chassis 003 S that one with I always I, I'm terrible at pronouncing being daddy and the vote is it uh, John how do you pronounce his last name he asked the non-Italian how to pronounce an Italian name can you believe yeah. this <laughs> we can't get this far through without mentioning Clemente Biondetti can we because the, the bloke won four times which is yeah. twice as much as anybody else won he raced within a few months of dying of cancer as yeah. well I mean the bloke was from Sardinia and my understanding is, is that the others were kind of snobbish with him. He's a southerner. Come on now. I think it was a social class thing. Yeah. And uh, there was even a thing between like the Piedmontese and the guys from, from the east. And I think, you know, the peasant from the agricultural island, I think that bloke really. Well, the other gentleman that William was referring to is Giuseppe Navone. Thank you. My Italian is not good. <laughs> John mentioned, though, but, you know, going to the cars, you, know, you could go in and start getting in the depth of a lot of these. But, you know, in 48, you know, there was obviously with the winning car. It's impressive for what they were able to do because these cars took a beating in regards to what that race was. 110 horsepower, top speed, 94 miles an hour. So you're not talking anything crazy fast. I mean, you're talking drum brakes. You're not talking something that's going to be stopped on a dime or everything like that. And, you know, and you know, you had a lot of long straights and whatnot there, but you had a lot of mountainous portion of this where you're on the, you know, using your brakes quite a bit. How John had mentioned about how new Valari's driving style regards to throwing the car around. I think, you know, a lot of these guys, you know, they started looking at, okay, how do I save this or whatnot? Because the car had to make it, you know, as that adage is, you know, to finish first, first you got to finish. These cars were fragile. Ferrari's biggest Achilles heel throughout all the subsequent years was the transmissions and the rear end and the axle that just because banging on the ground and just, you know, it, it took out Piero Taruffi, you know, five times, I think it was something like that, that he you know, was retired out of the race. Always the same thing. His rear end, his rear axle. Taruffi's like the Lloyd Ruby of the yeah. middle of isn't he? He's the guy who was always well-placed and then fell out in the most absurd, unlucky kind of. Yeah, up front or leading or whatnot, and that happens. And and it's a common occurrence. You know, these cars were fragile. And, and the other aspect is it's not so much, again, as we talk, going from like about here from 47 to 53, you're not talking major leaps and bounds in regards to torque, horsepower, speed. But again, just very fragile cars. You know, these things were all hand built. You know, you're not talking precision, getting out your micrometers and all this stuff and regarding your tolerances and gaps in that. You know, these guys are drinking at noon for lunch and having wine and everything like that, you know, and smoking. You know, it's just, I was not saying attention to detail wasn't there. You're not talking about obviously what it is today. It's just nowhere near. You have one car built and it's not like you're building five a day. Those, hey, you got one car a week, potentially. It's a very slow process, but these cars are very, very fragile. So do we know how many of these 47, 48, 49, early, early Ferrari race cars that were in the Mila Miglia still exist today? Not a lot. I mean, as you get into the you know, later years, when you start getting into 54, 5, 6 going on, there's more of those around that participated because there was 
numerous ones because you start getting towards the end of it. You know, you have 20 plus Ferraris in the race. So you're going to have quite a few that are roaming around that can say they've got million, million history. Now, obviously, you're only going to have that one that has a winning history. In your winning car, there's not that many in regards to production numbers. But, you know, you're going to have subsequent ones online. But he was not building hundreds and hundreds of cars. You had 20 of this, 10 of that, five of this. You know, so when you sit and think, oh, it's still running around now. I mean, all those cars were basically race cars. Yeah, I mean, a couple of them, hey, you'll drive down the street now. But these were meant to last. That wasn't their intent when they got built. It was, hey, I'm going to race this car for a couple of years, you know, and then it's just basically, say, junk. But basically, that's kind of what it was. And you look back at these old ads, you know, especially like people always pull up like for on 250 GTOs. Oh, hey, you can buy this thing for, you know, it was $2,500, $3,500 back in the early 70s. And I'm just like, oh, my God, you know, now it's 50, 60, 70, 80 million dollars. Again, they were just old beat up race cars. He had a few that were scrapped, you know, very common back then. You know, motor blew up get rid of it, pitch it, you know, put a different motor in it. A lot of these cars that came over to the U.S., you know, they dumped in, you know, a Chevy or a Ford motor in them. It's kind of tough to really trace some of these. I want to say there's not an abundance, but yeah, there's, you know, there's a decent amount running around. And what's interesting about this, and John, you might remember, there's a presentation from year before last from Trevor Lister and Don Caps from the Society of Automotive Historians, where they actually talk about the provenance of a lot of these cars, especially the Maseratis. You're hitting the nail right on the head, William, where they talk about, well, the engine blew up, so we took it out and we put in a different one, and then we called it the Model 167 instead of the 166, and it's the same chassis number, but the engine code doesn't match. And so there's all this sort of who cares because it was racing. And, you know, you listen to the presentation and how they dissect it all down and try to figure out the lineage of some of these cars and what is the provenance of these early race cars. And it's and basically at the end of it, you realize it's an extremely difficult, challenging task to nail down where some of them ended up or suddenly there's a new model of Ferrari. Well, it's really the yeah. old car with a different motor. Or this has been changed and they scratched out the VIN number and put a new one on. Right. So if you're interested in diving deep off the diving board onto that side of the pool, we're going to reissue that episode later. But it's really interesting that you bring that up because it is systemic, especially in Italy, all the manufacturers as a result of these races trying to evolve and perfect their cars. At its root, what my understanding of what Trevor List is saying is that Italian cars are often like motorcycles. So a motorcycle has a frame identity and it also has an engine number. And typically it's the engine number which we know the motorcycle. Has. Trevor's contention is, is that in most countries around the world, we know a car by its chassis number. However, the Italians and Ferrari and Maserati and so on, they would identify a car by its engine. So let's say I buy car number one with engine number one. I go out, I race it, I blow up the motor. I send my car back to the factory and I say, Ferrari, give me your latest, greatest engine. Ferrari says, okay, he takes the engine number one out. He puts engine number two in. I drive the car away. According to Ferrari, I'm driving engine number two. But according to the British government, I'm driving engine number one. I might be really happy with that confusion. This was car number two, because it's got engine number two. I would have to pay a whole new load more purchase tax. Whereas if I just say that this is just a part, even if maybe I balled the car up completely, and, you know, the only part left is my St. Christopher on the dashboard, it might suit me for tax reasons to say that actually I this is a different part of the same car. So there's not so what Trevor List has tried to do is partly unpick that, but mostly he thinks that a lot of the confusion can be unpicked if you follow engine numbers rather than chassis numbers. For the 48 winning car, scrapped. They took the motor out of it, but the car it got, you know, they raced a couple more times, but that car got scrapped and they put the motor into something else, whatnot. And it, it's interesting kind of jumping back to the 125S from 47. It, it went through all the different iterations, whatnot. But in 06, or well, early 2000s, I forget the gentleman's name, you know, but they tried to, I guess you would say, they recreated it, so to speak. But then there was also this argument that they were trying to say, no, it's that one, but showed it at Pebble Beach, but he didn't enter it. And it was, a, I guess, a big sigh of relief from all the judges and everybody else in the concourse because there was going to be a huge uproar in regards to legitimacy and history and everything in this car and trying to actually prove what it was. Ferrari was good, you know, documentation. And there's so many historians out there, you know, so many people that follow Ferrari and kind of go back and everything like that. So as you get more into, you know, the 50s, especially and on, mid-50s and on, it's pretty 
I'm going to say easy. You can go through and find history and what not series of cars are, but your late forties and early fifties, it sometimes can be a little difficult just because of what these cars went through and what they did with it. The reason why it's so complicated and difficult is there are many, many generations of auctioneers and classic car brokers who've spent a career out of saying my Maserati 250F is worth $5 million because it was driven by Sterling Moss, whereas yours is only worth three because it wasn't. Well, if suddenly mine might have been driven by Sterling Moss or yours might have been, or actually who the bloody hell knows who was driven by what? which is kind of what Trevor Lister says, introducing that level of confusion doesn't help anybody. And I'm reminded of a student who used to work for Stanford University. And for a while, Revs had a program running at, at Stanford that I was, was a part of. And I remember a student coming and looking for funding for a startup that he was going to do that was going to test paint depth and integrity. He was a chemical major to a much higher standard than it's currently done. And it took a couple of the old car guys to come to him and say, look, there's no upside to any of this. I don't need to know that my car's been repainted if I think it's original. And if you're buying the car off me, just believe that it's original. I think that it's original. You think it's original. Let's all believe that it's original. Believe the emperor has new clothes. Let's not just cast into doubt whether or not he may or may not be wearing any clothes because then everybody's going to lose. There's no upside to finding out that the car's had a new fender painted on it that was the point that was was made obviously john never watched the x-files the truth is out there (laughs) (laughs) william to your point about cars falling apart i I mentioned my involvement with stanford i did some work with a chap whose official title is the omar and anthea hoskins professor of classical history this is a dude who made a career out of looking at shards of greek pottery and comparing them with other shards of greek pottery coming up with a whole fresh way of understanding the way life developed on the greek peloponnesian peninsula so it, it sounds boring but it has this kind of really like profound point that we understand a lot more about ancient greece than we did before now he loves the story of the, the Mille Miglia in 1948 with Nuvolari with the Ferrari. He's given Ferrari has four entries. He sold one car to an Italian prince, but Nuvolari comes to him and says, look, Ferrari, I can't die in my bed. Give me a car to race. So Ferrari's like, oh, all right, I'll give you this car that I sold to this Russian nobleman. I'll give you that car and you can race in it. And the story is that the car falls apart under Nuvolari. The bonnet comes off and Nuvolari says, no problem, it's lighter now, we'll race better. The seat comes adrift. And this is the part that Michael Shanks, my academic colleague, likes. So so Nuvolari now races on on a bag of oranges and lemons. And we now have to think about this Sophia Loren and, you know, the personification of Italy here. So eventually the car (laughs) expires at the side of the road and Nuvolari is like at the side of the road and a priest finds him and says, can I help you, great Tazio? And Nuvolari says yes and sleeps in his bed. The priest gives him his bed to sleep in and Nuvolari, exhausted, sleeps in the bed and Ferrari weeps because he's not able to build a car which is strong enough for the passion that Nuvolari can bring to it. Obviously, me and Daddy winning the race, you know, you would think, I say accolades and whatnot, but everyone was so focused on Nuvolari and he was kind of getting all the attention. And I know Nuvolari is kind of like trying to push it back, but everyone was so focused on Nuvolari because he didn't win and everything that happened and stuff like that. So being that he's win kind of was, I want to say understated, but, you know, everyone was kind of more focused on Nuvolari than they were on the actual winner of the race day. Yeah. And Bill Daddy has this quote, doesn't he, that in the Mille Mille, you have to have the courage to drive slowly. You get the impression that contemporaries were cynical about him because you know, he was always the guy who you couldn't have drive steadily and still win the Mille Emilia, but he certainly didn't like put it out in the, in the way that Nuvolari did. The previous year, he'd raced this Chisitalia, been leading and it had got wet right towards the end. And he'd like had to change a spark plug. And the story I read in the Lorani biography is back at home in, in Mantua, he says to his old mechanic who'd refused to come with him, if you'd come with me, we'd have won. <laughs> <laughs> we'd have changed the spark because it took me five minutes to change the spark play. If you'd have come, we'd have done it in less time and we'd have won the race. <laughs> so that's 48. Biondetti wins at an average speed of 75 miles an hour. Biondetti again, 48, 75. 
and 49-82. Leon Dirty winning three years in a row. Look at the times, too. Is That's kind of a, a big leap because 48 at roughly a little over 75 miles an hour average speed, 15 hours, 5 minutes, 44 seconds. But then in 49, not that different of a car. But it was, it was a Barquetta, everything like that. You know, they changed up quite a bit, but it drops by three hours. It's huge. That's a lot. Yeah. I wonder if the weather was better. I wonder if it was a weather thing. And that plays into it. And, you know, rain was very prominent in that race year in, year out. Obviously, as you get into subsequent years, when the cars start getting bigger and faster, 48, you know, there was a weather issue. And you got to remember the tires that they were using back then. You're not talking specialized rain tires or anything like that. I mean, they were terrible tires. But that's a big leap. And obviously, it's been completely dry or whatnot. You know, you go from 48 to 49. But again, the two gentlemen, they, they win it again. And that just goes to tell you, he knew how to win that race. I would say he was a specialized guy for it. But two years in a row, winning for Ferrari it says a lot for being daddy and Devoni. The whole business of whether you raced with a Barquetta or whether you race with a closed car, the open car, of course, has got less air resistance. So fundamentally, is going to be a faster car for the same amount of horsepower, less weight. The closed car, because it keeps the weather off, and you're just that much more civilized. The argument is the closed car can be. So in 47, the Alpha that Biondetti wins with is closed. In 48, it was... That was a coupe. I mean, it was another 166 in 49. Because when you go from that, from 166S to a 16MM with the MM, I obviously stand for Mil Amelia, because now you know he's on this run. They basically took the 166S, shortened it just a bit. Obviously, they made it a Barquetta. You know, and a few other little tweaks here and there, you know, and created that car. Enzo's thought always was that you win this race in an open car. He thinks a race car is open. It's not a coupe. I don't know how much different, but obviously I think going from that coupe to that Barquetta and from what they changed on it, really, I want to say drastic, a max speed only goes up by maybe 15 miles an hour. You know, so you're not talking some massive jump where you're talking like 50 miles an hour faster. That's I think that's significant though, isn't it? Over the 10, 11 hours, the race would take something that could do 135 versus something that can do 120. Yeah. <laughs> when you step away from 1949, 1950, and you jump from the 166 MM to the 195 S, you're kind of going back to that squarish, garish, boxy look that was the early Ferraris, like the 125 and things like that. So I'm seeing this design language flip flop happening here as he's finding his way. Probably whoever was going to do the cheapest bodywork. There was a sale on square grills that week. <laughs> well, but no, but, but if you think about that, if I'm one of those little carrozzeria, and they were little, they were half a dozen guys at most. If a car with my body wins just its class in, mil in the middle, let alone winning the whole event, that's terrific advertising for somebody to come to my girl's rear for their nice Alfa Romeo or touring Fiat or whatever. So I feel like Ferrari wasn't exaggerating when he said that the body is like a dress on a beautiful woman. This is what it was, right? It was And, you know, we know that he just concentrated on the engine and was never that interested in, you know, making the brakes better or making the chassis better or anything like that. He just focused on making the engine better. And then you've got these coach builders who are competing with each other. These, yes, aerodynamic bodies on, but also good looking bodies because they want their car to be on the photograph of tomorrow's Sunday sports newspaper as the Millie Millie winner. Well, you mentioned 1950. So here we are, right? And I was already alluding to that with the change in design from the 166 to the 195S. So what's significant about the 1950 Millie Millie? It's the first time the Marzotto brothers make a real impact on the event. So this is a family of textile magnets. And there's four brothers, all of whom are super enthusiastic buyers and racers. And Giannino wins twice. And as William alluded to earlier, because the family were textile magnets, he would race wearing a double-breasted shirt and tie, even in an open car. You know, you're advertising your, your wares. There's an expression that noblesse obliged this notion that the wealthy and the, the nobleman should share what he has with the peasantry somewhat. So in other words, I can afford these fine clothes in this Ferrari. I'm not going to hide them under a bushel. In my, I'm not going to live in a compound. I'm not going to buy a Hawaiian island. No, I'm going to race the Mille Miglia wearing these fine clothes and driving this fine ferrari yeah all right so for me there's there's that element going on right the, the marzotto brothers feel to me less like 
uh, motor racers and more like I won't say playboys because that implies that they were womanizing and I don't know that they were and it implies that they weren't doing it seriously and they were doing it seriously but you know the Marzotto brothers were never gonna come to Dundrod and race in the rain of Northern Ireland you know the Nuvolari wanted to do that they weren't in that kind of realm And I think the big story that year is this absurdness where Marzotto struggles, where Giannino struggles to get a car and then gets a car and and wins the race. And then after the race, Ferrari says to him, oh, by the way, I changed the motor, so you owe me half the prize money because he fitted this bigger motor without Marzotto knowing. And this is another one of these Ferrari stories where one wonders how true it really is. That's the one thing, too, about that car. You go from 16 mm and you go up to his 195S. Obviously, that 195S that he won with, Chassis 0026M, when you look it up history-wise, it actually referred to as 166 because that's what he bought. And as John mentioned, unbeknownst to him, at the factory, they dumped in that bigger motor, and he didn't know it. And obviously, more power, everything like that. So it's called the 195S because of the motor and kind of going back to the thing, hey, it's designated, hey, it's by what the engine is, not so much the chassis. But that chassis was a 166 that he had bought for that. And then they just dumped in this bigger motor. So it's back and forth in regards to what I'm saying, but bumping it up. Now you're at 160 horsepower, got a top speed of just a hair under 137 miles an hour. So, I mean, you're creeping up there in regards to power and speed. You're still thinking that doesn't sound like a lot. But again, you're still talking about a car that's pretty basic in regards to stopping and everything like that. It gets going. But I always found that interesting in regards to how that car is looked at and viewed. Up until 1950, you mentioned it earlier, William. There were a couple Ferraris here, a couple Ferraris there. They were only building a handful of cars. And in 1950, the number of Ferraris entered in the Mille Miglia jumps about 5x compared to the previous year, where you have 16 Ferraris entered in the race. And that is pretty significant for a company in its third official year that is hand-building cars. Earlier in our conversation, John was speaking about Rome and the Romans and the chariot races, but then also getting into like the Vanderbilt Cup and everything like that. You know, and you mentioned NASCAR, you know, always that adage is, I always say that big everything is, you know, we'll win on Sunday, sell on Monday. That basically started way back when, when cars started doing it, because that was it. The car that was winning was the car that people wanted. Ferrari was winning, so these people that had the money... I want a Ferrari because that's what's winning. It started way back when. So it wasn't kind of started, you know, this NASCAR kind of marketing campaign went on Sunday, sell Monday. It was basically, it started from the dawn of the car, in essence, when they started racing because people wanted the car that wanted. That's kind of, you know, how these races also kind of came about in the beginning. It was an endurance race to test these cars, these manufacturers and these manufacturers to prove I have the best, strongest, fastest car. And that's what people wanted. 1950 into 51, we introduced a Ferrari 340 America. For me, this is when the horsepower figures and the top speed starts becoming interesting. And I think it's my own perception of what a fast car is, because I'm sure for my son, his generation, a car that can't do 150 miles an hour is not that fast. But for me, if a car can do 150 miles an hour and has more than 250 horsepower, it qualifies as a as a fast car, especially when the tires are as narrow and the brakes are as bad and the drivers and the event is generally as lunatic as the Mille Miglia. I feel this is the stage now where it starts to move into something where it's quite hard to believe that it was allowed to go ahead. 50 to 51. You know, you go from 160 horsepower to 220. Top speed is that, you know, just a hair under 137 in 1950 to just a bit under 150 in 51. That's a significant jump, especially on the horsepower scale in regards to what these engines are doing. I think that has to do with design and the engine. And was it Lampretti that was coming into play, creating these motors? Yeah. When we th- when I when you or I might think about 120 or 150 miles an hour, we imagine what that's like, you know, on a track day or on a notionally imaginative, you know, allegedly a quiet piece of freeway or autostrada, you might see those speeds. The important thing to understand about the Mille Miller is this is taking place through town, cross bridges. The V12, that's an important thing to talk about, isn't it? We talked about Ferrari and this agitator of men. Throughout the period, two V12 engines produced in 
multiple different capacities when he's friends with Columbo, the Columbo engine gets developed. When he falls out with Columbo, he hires Lamprady. Lamprady designs his own engine, and this engine grows in capacity. And then when he falls out with Lamprady, he rehires Columbo and develops the Columbo engine again. I'm told by Alain de Cadenet, let's name drop there. I did an event years ago called the Mille Millia North America with him. We had Buono 250 that was chassis number 0625. I know that car's still out there. It was not in great condition when de Cadenet and, and I drove it and it was looking under the hood of that car that he said to me it's a Columbo you can tell by the spark plug position one has the plugs high the other has the plugs low um I yeah but but yes absolutely we've got that and it seems to me the increased horsepower came simply from being able to do bigger displacement and I feel like there must have been things like we were getting better grade fuel so you could do higher compression ratios because my understanding was even if you could make the machine tools to do like high compression the fuel was so bad that you couldn't really do it you know there was no point in trying to do high compression everything everything was like a american car in the 1970s rather than american cars in the late 60s you know it was always pretty low compression stuff due to the poor grade of fuel didn't they bring in special race fuel did the organizers arrange that i, I know like the post-war like the first couple because of rationing and whatnot you know getting allotments you had to really go to the government but didn't they, because of the, you know, obviously compression, that stuff, didn't they have to get special, bring in good fuel? I read a story about somebody who'd missed the refueling rig, like a Ferrari team member who'd missed the refueling stop, stop for normal gas, like gassed up at a normal gas station. That normal fuel, the Ferrari couldn't run on that normal fuel. Yeah. What I am aware of is that, you were allowed what the British teams would call jungle juice in Formula One up until either 57 or 58. You know, the issue was, was that if, if I've mixed up special fuel, you have to go to the lengths of mixing up special fuel in order to be competitive with me. And then each of us are rushing around, spending loads of time trying to get hold of all these special fuels because this is the easiest way for us to make horsepower. And none of this really has anything to do with motor racing. So that's why those special fuels were banned in Formula One. I imagine there were standard fueling in the immediate post war period, there were fuel shortages. So the fuel had to be especially allocated, the tires and fuel. The stories of people, Italians entering early Mille Millions, getting their fuel and tires, and then just driving home. Why would yeah. you do the race? Because you only did it to get the free tires and fuel. As a side note, in case anyone listening is curious, actually the 50 and 51 car are currently owned by the same person. And I probably cannot pronounce it. Last name is right. It's it's Crow, C R O U L. Jack and Kingsley. They own both those cars. Oh. Well, who knew? William did. Yeah. <laughs> because now you're getting the car, you know, that raced and won, participated, and its current day still have its correct, you know, matching numbers, everything, engine, gearbox, everything. This is when you start getting to values of a car that kind of, I guess, get obscene. Because it plays a huge role in regards to race history and value of a car. And especially if you have a winning car, especially of a stature of the Mille Amelia, Targa Florio, Le Mans, that really takes the value of the car exponentially higher just because of the exposure and the profile of it. So how much does it add? I mean, you know, again, something's only worth what someone's willing to pay, but it really adds value to that car if it has it on its CV in regards to winning a, a very high profile race like that value wise you'd have to go back and kind of look but you know it's not like these things pop up every year or at every auction like say f40s and stuff like that where you kind of can gauge the market based on that these pop up you know every maybe five six seven years and markets change so much at a consistent basis it's kind of hard to pinpoint what something's worth get your experts out there and they can start putting a number on it or throw a number at it you don't know until a it goes through an auction and either it sells or it doesn't sell, it doesn't hit reserve. So you kind of see what the market's saying, or you kind of know through the grapevine that, hey, it was sold privately at this price. So that's when you start getting these values in regards to, you know, not hundreds of thousands of dollars. You're talking seven, eight, nine, 10, 20 million dollars, you know, going up. I wouldn't say, you know, getting into these 
with these one nine fives and that stuff, you know, you're not getting into 15 million. So, I mean, you're going to be in that five to 10 million range. I think it starts getting into, I would say use, especially this day and age and what you can do with these cars and going to events. You're starting to see a lot more. It's not just, Hey, they're just sitting on the lawn. Hey, they're driving them and participate in the mail mail or participate in the Colorado grand or the California mail mail, getting out there and utilize these cars. And they're still very, I don't want to say archaic, but you know, the technology is getting there. You want to drive these things and, and use them on a regular basis. It gets very, very touchy because something breaks. You can't just go and find a new NOS part on these things. You know, it depends on the owner as well. You know, you have some guys, I don't care. They got so much money. They just, I'm going to go enjoy it, which is great because then more people get to see it. Where then you got other people, they own these cars, they stick them in their collection and no one ever gets to see them, but them and their family. And people always ask, well, how is that worth this? John, me and you have had this conversation. You know, Eric, we've had this conversation on, on previous episodes and stuff like that about values and stuff. It's the story though, isn't it? If you're buying a Honda Accord, you know, in the used car trade in Britain, people will say, oh, it's got no stories, mate. That means, you know, it definitely, you know, it hasn't been robbed and, you know, joy ridden <laughs> and then it's tarted up and is now being sold to you. You know, it's been owned by the cliched one lady owner, hasn't it? So the no story when you're buying your Honda Accord, you definitely want a car with no stories. When you're buying your Ferrari F40, do you want the one that was owned new by the cocaine dealer who drove it into a swimming pool? Yes. Or do you want the one that was owned by, <laughs> you know, the Chinese millionaire who put it in a hermetically sealed container? Now, the market would tell you the hermetically sealed car that has absolutely no stories about it at all. That's the one you want. Now, the irony with these kind of Ferrari is the car that has no story has less value than the one that has all the stories associated with it. And, you know, we're also in a place where the worse the condition, it's got a new leather seat in it. Well, so what? It's got a new leather seat in it like every other vintage Ferrari. It's got a, the old leather seat. You mean Tazio Nuvolari farted on that seat? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. He did. Well, you know, I'm going to, at this point, how many other leather seats can you buy that Tassio Nuvolari actually farted on that are attached to a racing car that you can show to your friends? So at this point, suddenly, it doesn't matter to me whether it costs $12 million or $15 million. I told my friend I was going to have the seat that Nuvolari farted in. And by Jimny, I'm going to have it. And that does drive values of them. And it's it's funny, you know, we're, we're talking about 51. We're talking about the car that Villarese won in 1951 with. For many years at Pebble Beach, I've done a slightly, I wouldn't say sneaky thing, because it's not really sneaky, because anybody can do it. But I'm not wealthy enough to be in the Quail ticket lottery. But that is the best show to go to at Pebble. You know, the Pebble Beach itself is great, but really the Quail... If you, especially if you prefer post-war cars, as as I tend to, the Quail is, uh, is is probably even better. So what I'll usually do is wait till the Friday afternoon until it's closing up. And when they're loading all the cars up, I'll just walk across the field. Most of the cars have gone, but you still see a few lying around. One day I spent a good 15 minutes with Villarese's 1951 Mille Millia winner because, uh, you know, they were moving the cars around, but it was just there sitting on the lawn on its own and had a really nice um, few moments with it. So the bottom line there is, is that it's great that owners feel the need to, to bring them out and it's great that they've survived because I had a total like, you're not meant to touch these things, are you? But I did rest my hand on the door handle and think to myself, Villarese stood here the morning, you know, when he got in the yeah. car before he won the race, you know. So I did, uh, I did allow myself that. And I, I should just say, a lot of my knowledge of the Mille Millia comes from a series of books, publishers Brooklyn's books, and they've done a series on great motor races on the Millia, on Carrera Panamericana, on the Targa Florio. But the cover of the edition that covers the 1951 Mille Millia is Villarese's Ferrari with a bunch of front end damage on it. And it's obviously he's gone off the road, not seriously, but just a little bit. And that to me really speaks of what the Mille Millia is all about because, you know, the winning car went off the road and suffered damage. It's not like Formula One where if you put a wheel wrong, it's over. This is an event where there's bumps and bruises on the on the winning car, like a NASCAR. Yeah, exactly. Mentioning like the hermetically sealed F40. Yeah, it, that's the one that people want to go after. But what's unfortunate is like, you can't drive it then. That's the problem. 
is you're going to buy it. It's, it's just, it's something to look at because it loses its value. You start putting the miles on. And this is a mechanical being entity. It's meant to be started, driven and going. I mean, it needs to be lubricated, everything like that. So it's, and that car, God knows what it would take. You got to commission it to get it back onto the road itself. You don't have to replace everything because you couldn't drive it. If it's only got, say, 500 miles since 1988, you really can't drive. It. You know, it's going to take a lot of money to get that thing up to be able to do it. But you wouldn't want to because it loses value. So what I've learned from this is confirmation of two previous Break Fix episodes. One is the first question I need to ask when buying a Ferrari of this period is A, what does it smell like? And B, going back to our Italian car episode, I definitely want the one with the crack pipe in the glove box, right, William? Exactly. That's got the story. <laughs> I, I guess that can be seen is like, you know, to quote John says, all right, the new Valari fart, who farted in this car? See, what does it smell like? That's what, what it, it smells like. Down who to. farted in this car? <laughs> all old Volkswagen smell like melting crayons. That's all I know. <laughs> so that brings us to 1952. And I think we're going to close out the thought with 52 and 53, their significance before we pick up for the second half of the Mille Emilia coverage on the Ferrari marketplace. You know, more power, higher top end speed. But the interesting fact is now what you start getting into is, you know, obviously pre-war, but then post-war too, is you always had usually a mechanic riding with you. There was always someone next to you in the passenger seat. But as you start getting into these years, you start seeing not so much 52, but I, I know when 53 kind of started, is you start seeing guys start racing by themselves. The winning car, again, 250, 230 horsepower, 10 horsepower jump. It's going up more. It's almost at 156. So it's jumping up there. 0156ET is the winning chassis number of 1952. I think it's fascinating that he gave to Rufi like a uh, open four and a half liter. And he gives Braco, who wins, a closed three liter. Yeah. There's no even sense that, you know, I'm going to build the same engine, but, you know, do some open cars and some closed cars. There's no sense of that whatsoever. We're just going to do whatever. I feel like Braco doesn't feature in much other motor racing history. He wasn't part of the team, the Alpha Formula One team or anything like that. He, and one source I read refers to him as a, as a hill climb specialist. The other story that I'd read that was particularly uh, amusing uh, about him was he's known as a hill climb specialist. And of course, on the Mille Mille, you've those two passes, the Futa and the Raticosa, where it was often felt that, you know, here was a, a section where you, the driver, could make a, a real difference. You know, if you attacked over the, those passes, that was a way that you could maybe make a difference in a way that the flat out, flat straights around Cremona and Mantua and all those bits between the middle of the country and back up north, all those bits wouldn't allow you to make the same kind of difference. So the, the, the story is that, that in in 52, Braco was behind Kling as they do this northern phase. And as they leave Florence or as they approach, Braco says to his co-driver, I will lead by by Florence or, you know, I'll lead by then or uh, as long as you keep plying me with this brandy that you're, you're <laughs> buying me with. And yeah, Braco had that reputation of being the kind of hit the sauce quite a bit. <laughs> and, and the story that I'd read was that when he beat Kling, Kling was never the same again because he was like beaten. The pictures of Braco, you know, he's often in an ill-fitting sports jacket and he's like Vartsi in that he always seems to have a cigarette on. Unlike Bonetto, Bonetto's the one that's always got the pipe on. It's quite peculiar to think about people in middle age in the way that Braco was, who are able to do this completely kind of, of you know, sports bikers talk about brain out. They'll say, you say, you know, how was your ride? And they say, oh, it was brain out, mate. And what that means is that I took my brain out. I wasn't thinking. I just instinctively so you know did you split between cars at 120 miles an hour yeah and i feel like fascist philosophy that was with italy right the way from the early 20s right the way through to the mid 40s that fascist philosophy believed that a state of war was natural believed that a level of attrition was natural so guys like Nivellari and bracco grew up with this motto, either it goes or I'll crash it. You know, it was win or crash. Absolutely 
a win or crash philosophy and and that must have been very hard to compete with and certainly the brits i mean donald ely went and competed in an early mille milia and he describes it as a lunatic race and i feel that braco probably personifies that lunacy even more than biondetti or even more than the names like ascari or castellotti that we've heard as formula one stars this guy who was a hill climb guy who didn't really do much, you know, kind of retired, but was persuaded back. I don't think he was even going to race. I think Villarese was meant to race. And I think he took Villarese's seat in this hill climb special car. So yeah, amazing personality. That's the, old, the year that Mercedes came and basically started, I want to say a big push or onslaught. They showed up like a month early for the race. Cat, all their guys camped out and just repeatedly, repeatedly, Doing the whole course, learning it, learning it, learning it. Could that have played into Kling's little thing? And, you know, Neubauer had his his strategy in regards to his three guys. Hey, you're the tortoise. You're the hare. You're, you know, this guy's chasing you and going. They tried to really hammer it, and Rocco still wins. And Kling was leading for a long time, but then they got to the hills, and he went past them. <laughs> I think that, like you said, John, I think that really just chafed Kling's ass. And God, I was like, how the hell is this guy doing it? Because those SLs, but they were, you could probably say they were superior to that Ferrari, technologically, horse, everything. But comes down to just knowing the course and technique and what have you. But Bracco triumphed in the end. Sterling Moss was racing a Jag. And I think he only made it a few miles or something like that. I know he didn't finish. But yeah, he didn't have much success. Well, that's really a point worth making, isn't it? That we're talking about how dominant Ferrari was. We talked about Mercedes winning a couple of times. We've not talked about Maserati winning at all. No. We've not talked about Porsche winning at all. Now, albeit they were really just starting. But Jaguar were pretty dominant at Le Mans in this period. Five wins at Le Mans. Nothing at the Mille. Was it because they didn't try? Hmm. One year, Biondetti had a Jaguar. Yeah. Was it because the cars weren't tough enough where they could win Le Mans? Was it because they weren't able to cope with the rough roads, the changing surface, all of that? Was it because the people driving them didn't have the local knowledge? It tended to be, you know, we tended to put Brits in them and it took us a while to figure out that it was probably a better idea to give them to people like Fangio and Biondetti to do the job in. It's a blend of the cars that Ferrari was building and the drivers who he was putting in them. Yeah, it's impressive that you can call on somebody of the calibre of Braco. I mean, something that I'm really struck by is clearly to win, you had to drive in a way where personal safety was of a secondary consideration. And, and there's this sense, I love Giuseppe Farina, but Farina, it was in the Virgin's hand. You know, whether or not I crash or wreck has nothing to do with me. I'm in the hand of fate. I'm in the hands of the Virgin. If you ally that with this sort of fascist philosophy, my word, it's it, it is it's frightening. It's it's like that sort of teenage boy intensity, but it's been refined through a world war. And now, what Ferrari's given us the equipment to go out and do this. We'll talk later about Ferrari's brush with the papacy around the Mille Miglia, but morally there's something a little he's drinking his brandy and driving flat out over the raticosa pass and then speeding through crowds of people i mean it's hard to believe that it's, it's just so italian i mean if you think about it, it in an alliterative sort of way it's passion and power equals perfection and that's sort of Ferrari in a nutshell, when you think about it, right? It takes that exuberant teenage passion like you're talking about, the extra power of these big engines that they're, again, they're throwing caution to the wind, saying the body's the body, whatever. We're going to build a bigger, better mousetrap, bigger engine. And then it's putting those two, the crazy with this big engine, and that gives you the win. And when you think about, yes, the Mercedes is a better car, or the Porsche was better engineered, or the Jag had this advantage or whatever, but it never panned out because the variables didn't align correctly. You know, the superiority of the Benz with a sterile, very utilitarian driver, it's not going to happen. You can do all the practicing and calculations you want and perfectly apex every turn on a thousand mile route. But it doesn't work if you're not adaptable and you don't drive, like you said, with your brain out and you stop thinking. And this translates to all sorts of disciplines of motorsport. When you think about Formula One and you talk about just we'll pick three names from the same era, Senna, Prost and Mansell all champions in their own rights, completely different drivers, excellent machinery, 
but who's the better driver, right? And if you take the unruly boyish nature of Senna and his car, it's sort of like Brandini and Marzotto and all the rest of these guys that are just driving with everything in the wind and they're having fun doing it. So maybe that's part of the equation, right? Is that reckless abandon lets you push to 11 tenths where everybody else is not. I certainly like, think that's part of the Ferrari magic. 100%. 100%. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Everyone oh, yeah. wants Ferrari apparel, right? The reason you want a Ferrari logo on your shoe is that you want to have some of that. It's like when you put the Brute 33 <laughs> on, you feel like Barry Sheen. You know, it's that kind of <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That was one thing too, and again, going back to like how we said about, you know, cars, I say, get into participation, you know, and, and, you know, having a Ferrari that's in there. But in that race, there was 27 Ferraris entered out of the 501 that started. So wow. 501 cars start. I mean, and just think about that number, 501 cars started that event. Because you always see a lot of these things where they start on that ramp. 52 was actually the first year that they started on that ramp. They didn't have it before. And the reason being is because they wanted people to be able to see the spectators. So when the guys, they pulled up onto the ramp, they could see who was driving or that instead of, you know, being on the ground, you know, it had all these crowds. It was tough to see. So, hey, let's build a starting ramp. They roll up and go. But 52 was the first year they had that. Which is interesting because the only other discipline of motorsport that still does that to this day is rally. Yep. I found that interesting, too, because I was like, oh, wow. It's like you, you think in your mind, you see, you think they just, oh, they always did that. 52 was the first year they started doing that. And it was just so spectators could see their heroes, these people that were driving. And that's what it boiled down to because, you know, these people were so adored, especially in Italy. You know what I'm struck by? We've talked about how crazy the driving was. When you looked at the film of them, they were always driving slowly. Yeah. I was watching some film with my son, who's like nine, and I was thinking that, thinking like, he's not seeing that. They're like skidding around the corner. They're like driving. And I'm like, oh, yeah, he's just like come into the town that we're in. He's been doing like 180 out of the town. He's now like tested the brakes and slowed down. Yeah, it's like the TT. All of the film, when you see the Isle of Man TT, the films them, you know, jumping over that little humpback bridge. That's the only part of the course where they're doing less than 30 miles an hour. But that's the part of the course where the camera is because you can actually see them and, and catch all of that. So that shell film and a lot of films, although they're awesome representations of the event, I like the shell film, but it's only when you're out on the road and you can see the other cars coming past the camera car that you really get a sense of the speed. The Kalmanski was, I don't know if he was, him and Collins were running together yet because, you know, in subsequent years, Kalmanski you know, did phenomenal photos and taking video and there's a few other instances of some participants basically just starting a race and then just you know bailing because they were doing a film or something like that. But I saw the number of cars starting. And what's you see the other the number there were actually 607 cars entered, but only 501 started. So I mean you had over 100 cars that didn't even start the event itself for whatever reason. Think about that. And then how your number is what time you start. There always was the premise was the slower cars start at first. Now, you would think, no, let's start the fast cars first. But it's like, no, the slowest cars started first. The fast ones started last. So you always had that drama of them come flying by these slower cars and had to pass. So not only are you dealing with these roads, dealing with the crowds, because obviously when you watch this stuff, there's no barriers. There's no anything like that. I, I can't. I don't know if it was in 52. I know there's there, there's one in there that cars were crashing at a certain point on the on the course. They eventually, from them crashing, they took out the guardrail. I don't know if it's 53. It might have been 53. But so the guardrail's gone. The cars are there. So the person that's coming through, and I want to say it was the winner, he crashes in that court because the guardrail's gone. He only kind of goes off, but he hits one of the person's cars. And so the damage isn't significant. So he keeps going and goes on. The person that he hit, then they went after him to pay for it to fix his car because he hit it. it. It kind of just shows you what they were dealing with. Here's where we're going to go. We're going to go into 1953. And what we're going to do is after they get done, we're going to pause. And what we're going to do is we're going to have a second part to this discussion that we will put that out next week. Just make everyone know that we still got a subsequent other half to go because what we're going to get into in that other half too, we start talking is obviously the increase in horsepower of the cars, but we're also going to get into because of 1957 being the last race, but also with the new Ferrari movie that came out, Kind of have a little discussion with that and how it all ties in. But we're going to jump into 1953. There's a lot of interesting things with 1953. You go from 1952 with 330 horsepower from the winning car to 300 horsepower for the winning car. 
you go into a 340mm, uh, here they're under 168 miles an hour. So it's actually not too much faster top speed, but your horsepower has increased immensely. You know, the winner, Gianno Marzato, winning the race. But what's interesting about the fact is he didn't have a car when that race was supposed to start. He was actually supposed to race, I believe it was, he was supposed to race one of the Alfa Romeo, one of those disco volantes. He was promised a car. He went on, I guess you would say, it was a family, whatever, getaway to uh, Lebanon for where his one part of his family was from. But when he returned, he did not have a car. They said, nope, sorry, they assigned it to someone else. He went then and tried to make some calls. He called Lance, said they didn't have a car. Now, you would think, no brainer, well, why doesn't he just get a Ferrari? Well, he had a bit of a dust up with Enzo because he had built and designed a car affectionately called the Egg. And if you look it up, you'll see why they called it the Egg. He started, I guess, say, dabbling and looking at and understanding aerodynamics of a car. You know, how it affects it, top speed, everything, and where it's worked. Now, obviously, it's very crude in regards to doing it, you know, not kind of anywhere near what's today. But it started entering the picture, which is rather impressive, for 1953. And you take a look at the car, you can see where they're coming from. Now, the interesting fact was Enzo wasn't too happy, but Marzato and the Marzato family and the brothers were such good customers. You know, he kind of uh, gritted his teeth and kind of dealt with it. Now, the one problem they had, though, with the egg was the radiator that they was supplied to them by Ferrari was the wrong one because the weight was supposed to rest in there. And so what their problem is they had front end lift, which was creating, you know, obviously very light in your steering in certain aspects, especially when you're going down straight. So when he got back, his mindset was, well, I don't have a car. He was all prepared and he started to was dust that off and he was going to bring that car back. And that was a couple year old car itself. Well, his co-driver, how would you say that? Is it Crosera? I'd say Crisara. He played mediator between Enzo and Marzato. And it was interesting how he played it off because you would tell Enzo, oh, yeah, he's sorry. Oh, yeah, and this, that. And then he was going to Marzato and saying, oh, Enzo, oh, yeah, he wants it back. So it's kind of played off. Where, so they kissed and made up. The car they gave him actually was from a previous race. It was sitting in the corner. It was beat up, didn't have a clutch. You know, it needed some stuff done to it, needed some work. So he says, I can give you this. You know, and Enzo's not thinking, oh, he's going to win this race like this because it was beat up from this previous race. Well, they get it up running, and there you have it. He wins the race in this car, you know, basically getting it last minute from Enzo. I mean, literally, like, I think a week or two before the race. So, I mean, it was very, very rushed in getting it. But, you know, hey, he took it and won. So what else in 1953? The wonderful Shell film was made, and that gives a more effective document of the race visual document of the race than any mille milia there may be more stuff out there in in italian archives but certainly on if you surf around on youtube this 53 film which as i say is this ai enhanced version of it that's available on youtube so sure you're coming from the perspective of shell right that they want you know their appetite and their product somewhat but for the first time you know this helicopter coverage of the race and the race itself is is a good one the the Alfa Romeo's are fast Fangio's back from an injury feels like he has a lot to prove he's leading at Rome over the Futa or Raticosa he develops steering issues and um, Marzotto passes him and, and wins or at least you know Marzotto overtakes him and wins in that final stage and and again you know, Marzotto's win is worth talking about for, for me. The, the thing really worth talking about is Fangio finishing second in a car that only steered on one wheel. You know, as a friend of mine said, well, at least he didn't have to drive it over any dangerous mountain passes. And at least he wasn't driving it at more than, you know, 130 miles an hour. The drum brakes were as big as wheels anyway, so it was OK, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 26 Ferraris entered and 12 had retired, I think, before Rome. Yeah. That gives you the attrition rate. And the other thing, and the Brooklyn's books will give you the impression of like a, you know, will give you the, the, the race by race. But what I'm struck by is how often the leader is leading and crashes out. He doesn't like <laughs> suffer a problem. He just straight ahead crashes out. Sanezi's leading. He's in a wall. Out ski. There's no like, you know, you don't just change the tire and carry this isn't Gran Turismo where you just respawn further down the track. No, you're just you're out. And if you're eating hospital food, you're lucky. My own particular 
guy from the period, Giuseppe Farina. I mean, Farina seems never to have even made it as far as Pescara, you know, which is where they come from Brescia down the right hand, down the Adriatic coast, and then then right across to Rome, and then right again up to... He never even made it that far, because and Ferrari says about him in, in, in his book about racing drivers that he was like a high-strung racehorse. And you get this sense that he just couldn't, like, contain himself to do an event that required a bit of endurance like you know a bit of caring for the car like the Mille Mille or, or Le Mans. It takes that certain I guess you would say um, holding yourself back you, know, you want to go 10 tenths these guys I think that you're winning to your point like the number you said you know you had 26 start but only 12 finished I think the year before it was 27 start I think only nine finished something I have to go back and look at the exact numbers but you know the attrition rate was so high crash him or the car breaking down it happened quite a bit so they just kind of use it as a reference you know that's how Lamar was too for the longest period of time before it comes just flat out sprints it is now you had to feel that car and understand it and take care of the car and get yourself there to the finish line but you also had to go at a rapid enough rate that you're going to win my understanding is one year Mike Hawthorne was so unhappy at the prospect of race 57 the year he'll won like he'll prove himself it was going to be rainy and miserable so Hawthorne deliberately wrecked the clutch early in the race so that they didn't have to race in, in the rain. I mean, that's, <laughs> I've not seen that written down, just reading between the lines and knowing what I know about Mike Hawthorne. <laughs> it, it, it feels to me that, that that would have been the case. So a 25-year span in our first part here covering the Mille Miglia, what are the three big takeaways? What did we learn from looking at the early days of the Mille Miglia? What do we leave our audience with in part one? Looking at it pre-war and what you know everyone was trying to achieve, but even post-war up to including 53. Now, 53, obviously, as we discussed, you know, there was that big jump from 52, 53 in cardiac horsepower. And I agree with John, you know, you're starting to see, you know, I want to say it's almost these are becoming true race cars. The stuff he was building, yeah, you know, it's coupes, whatnot. Yeah, I mean, they were, he had them in his mind. Hey, they're race cars, but you could drive them on the street and drive them, you know, very delicately. Obviously, you have racing clutches and whatnot. But this is what, you know, it's starting to transition to the full-blown race cars for this race. So all your stuff up until this point, you can see that relationship and see, that, you know, hey, between a street car and a race car, it's like, wow, you know. I mean, identical. I mean, you're not talking anything radically different. You know, you're not talking massive horsepower. You're not talking, you know, massive top speed. You know, you're talking these gentlemen drivers, you know, these guys racing in double-breasted suits, you know, no helmets. I would guarantee, you know, majority of these cars didn't have seatbelts. You know, that adds back into the, you know, F1 race stuff like that in the open-wheel single-seater. You know, they wanted to be thrown from the car, but you're talking, you know, these closed coupes. You know, you'd think you'd want to be kind of bucked down, but a lot of them probably didn't have seatbelts in, let alone, you know, safety harness. You know, you're not talking roll cages or anything like that. These were elegant cars, you know, leather interiors just laid out. I mean, beautiful cars. The technology and what was how these cars were built. There wasn't a massive jump. You know, pre-war is building up, it's getting there. But then all of a sudden the war derails everything in regards to progress and technology advancement. Then all of a sudden, you know, the war ends and you're basically dealing with, technology from pre-war mid late 30s there wasn't any advancement because everything went to the war so i mean all of a sudden you're back into going racing that but you're actually working with and racing with technology that from the 30s it's playing catch up and then obviously it takes those few years to get those advancements going and start trying new things and kind of really you know getting those engineering down you gradually see it but then all of a sudden you can see in those five six years when they started going back again from 47 to 53 okay now we had that five six years so everything's caught up now we've tried these things hey we could do this whatnot hey we're taking this technology from you know airplanes or this and that we're gonna dump it in here and do these things so you start getting to that point where you're gonna see that big jump from 53 into 54 you know, and not only seeing the fact that it's an Italian basically only race in the beginning here, but now you're starting to see these other manufacturers from different countries starting to participate. You know, so you got your, you know, Jaguar company, you got Porsche, you got Mercedes, you know, you got these guys starting to show up with these cars that, you know, hey, they're new to the scene. But, you know, you're starting to see that expansion. You know, you still have these hundreds and hundreds of cars starting, but, you know, you're not seeing 95% of them Italian-built cars. You're starting to see them from outside it. It's kind of interesting how these things are progressing in regards to just advancement 
and technology and what they were working with. Pretty impressive. And just the shape of the cars, you know, you look at the pre-war stuff, the look of those cars, you know, when you think pre-war, you're thinking Bentleys and stuff like that. And that's what a lot of these look like. Look at the SSK, how those things were, you know, almost like say cycle fendered cars and that stuff and how it was. It wasn't these closed, full-bodied cars. They had these certain looks to them. But then all of a sudden, bam, you come back post-war, they're a completely different animal. My sort of takeaways is that this is an event which sits right in the middle of automobility it's like the very beginning of automobility in that it's a city to city flat out run over the dogs f everybody road race but there's no doubt that ferrari is the single maker who's most associated with this race sure fiat well there were far more fiat's entered but what a ferrari is what a grand touring luxury automobile is that was a vehicle that could win the mille milia you know what ferrari is was forged in the crucible of the mille milia so when we look at a late 20th century ferrari like an f40 that car owes absolutely its dna is the mille milia and the mille milia's dna is this beginning of motoring so that would be my take all right, guys, like I said before, we're going to have a second part to this series on the Million Million. We'll get that out to you. Hopefully, we should have it out uh, next Friday for Ferrari Friday. I appreciate everyone listening. And remember, the Motoring Podcast Network, motoringpodcast.net. And don't forget to check out John's, the Motor Historian. We got a lot more stuff coming, so I appreciate everybody listening. But great stuff coming, guys. Appreciate it. Back to you soon. This episode has been brought to you by Grand Touring Motorsports as part of our Motoring Podcast Network. For more episodes like this, tune in each week for more exciting and educational content from organizations like the Exotic Car Marketplace, the Motoring Historian, Brake Fix, and many others. If you'd like to support Grand Touring Motorsports and the Motoring Podcast Network, sign up for one of our many sponsorship tiers at www.patreon.com forward slash GT Motorsports. Please note that the content, opinions, and materials presented and expressed in this episode are those of its creator, and this episode has been published with their consent. If you have any inquiries about this program, please contact the creators of this episode via email or social media, as mentioned in the episode.